بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. Welcome. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Good evening. This is our second series of workshops that we have for our KFPB uh, students. Yesterday we had, well, last night we had one for our graduate students. Today it's open for all students. And we are thrilled and privileged and honored as well to have a wonderful, awesome, hip, cool, just that it continues all the way, you know, a group of folks coming all the way from the United States of America, from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, we have here today Mr. Tim Hayden, so I want everybody just to wave to him and say, hi, Tim. Hi, everyone. Cool. And we have also Professor Sarah Kondur from Metallic Engineering, so please say, hi, Professor Kondur. Hi. And also we have Professor Jerry Katz, so you can say hi, Professor Katz. Hi. Oh, louder! Louder. Hi. Hi. Awesome. So uh, they're going to talk to you tonight about the real life of an entrepreneur learning from failure. And this is something that is always being a question for you folks that failure, failure, what if, the what if question. So these guys have the magic behind avoiding, you know, uh, failure. Is it avoiding or sustaining or coping, coping with failure? So uh, I'm sure you're going to have a wonderful uh, evening today with the folks. And it's going to be interactive, according to what I understood. So please, please, please talk to your colleagues about these events. I'm, I'm listening to a lot of complaints that we didn't receive this. Tell them, check your KPM emails, follow my tweets. We are sending all of these messages across the university, and yet some people, you know, they complain that we don't have enough marketing. So we're gonna we're gonna find another marketing strategy, I'm sure. But but you know, take the opportunity that we have such wonderful folks coming all the way just to you know share with us something very 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 important. Okay, I'll leave you, folks. So so please, a round of applause to everybody, and then we'll start. Okay, so how do you all know it's meant? That's my American slang. I'm going to keep throwing it out all the sure, sure. <laughs> Just make it your undergrad so you can start picking up all this. You'll probably know more than I do. So even before we start, we're going to start with a little bit of introduction, but from you all. So just by a show of hands, where are you all kind of from? How many are from the Eastern Province? Or uh, Eastern, what do we call it? Eastern Province. Eastern Province, yep. Okay. How many from the Western? Okay. How many from middle, Riyadh area? Okay. How many are from out of the country? Okay. So keep your hands raised. How many are within uh, 500 kilometers from here? Okay. How many from further out? Okay. Who is the furthest away? Where are you from? Nigeria. Nigeria? Is that the furthest? Okay. We'll go with that. So good. So here's the reason why we do that. And then we'll start with our instructions. And the reason is this, you need to know each other while you're in school. You're gonna get to know so many good people, and these are the people you wanna continue on with for the rest of your life, no matter where you go in the rest of your world. You wanna hold on to these folks. And the reason is because you're gonna come up with a lot of different ideas, a lot of different entrepreneurial ideas. Maybe just going into business for yourselves, maybe going into business for corporations, but you wanna keep in touch with each other, okay? So that's one of the initial questions. So, my name is Tim Hayden. I am from St. Louis, Missouri, right in the heart of the Midwest. I oversee the Center for Entrepreneurship at St. Louis University by day. By evening, I'm an adjunct professor of entrepreneurship, and then by day and night, I'm an entrepreneur by heart, okay? 10 businesses, no, seven businesses in the last 10 years. So we'll get into a little bit more of that a little bit later. On my right, we have Dr. Jerry Katz. The reason why I'm introducing him is because I was one of his students. So just like you all have your professors here, use them. So I actually came through the master's program. I had an idea. Came back to St. Louis University, and my thesis for my MBA, my master's program, became my business under this man. He is considered a godfather within entrepreneurship education. The man has been teaching for 30, 32 years entrepreneurship. Wharton, Harvard, St. Louis University. So the man has got a lot of knowledge in entrepreneurship. And we're blessed to have him in our business school. And then we have Dr. Condor. And Dr. Condor is out of our engineering department. 
And I'll say we're very blessed to have him as well because he is an engineer by heart, but an entrepreneur by brain and heart. And so he brings a lot to the table. A lot of extensive experience, a lot of great motivation for our students, engineering students more than anything else, but then also floats out into the business school, arts and science, and so on and so forth. And so that's the three of us. We throw this out there for one reason again. Just like we want you to know each other, we want you to know us. Because it now may be a conversation start. Okay? So that's the introduction side. So now let's tell you really quick, how many people have ever heard of St. Louis, Missouri? Uh -huh. St. Louis, Missouri is where we're from. Okay, one, two, three. Springfield. Springfield, okay. Region, I love it. And then obviously St. Louis, Missouri. So, a little bit of background about St. Louis and St. Louis University. So we are the gateway to the Midwest. You're all familiar with Boston? You're all familiar with Los Angeles? Chicago, maybe? We are next to Chicago, dead middle of the United States. We are what they call the gateway to the Midwest. We have the St. Louis Arch right in the middle of it. Okay? You're all engineers. You have to look up the St. Louis Arch at some point in time in your life because it is an engineering marvel. 630 feet wide, 630 feet tall, and it is one massive arch that you can go up in and back down. Okay? We are the gateway to the West because we are founded by entrepreneurs. Everybody that was coming through St. Louis was on their way from the East Coast of Boston all the way to the West Coast of California. They all stopped in St. Louis. So we were founded by entrepreneurs. People just stopping off saying, you know what? I'm on the gold rush. I'm heading on through. And that's kind of where we started. St. Louis University. Oh, and we're home to the St. Louis Cardinals. I had to plug that. If anybody knows Major League Baseball, St. Louis Cardinals is our baseball team. We're in the World Series right now. So we've all been staying up late. The game starts at 3 a.m. here. We've been watching it starting up at 3, 3.30 in the morning. So it's been an interesting ride here. So St. Louis University. We are in the center of St. Louis. So just like you have K KFU PM sitting right here in the middle of town, in the middle of St. Louis is St. Louis University. We were started in 1818, our business school was started in 1910, and our engineering school was started in 1927. So now here's my question. Does that give you enough picture of St. Louis? I mean, can you visualize what I'm talking about, the arch, what we have going on? Okay, can you understand where our climate is? I haven't even talked about. I don't think so. So what I'd like to do, if it's okay with you, is show just a small video of here is St. Louis. Or maybe not. Okay, so with that being said, our agenda for this evening. Dr. Katz, would you like to take this one? Sure. We really have three topics for you tonight. Part of this, we want to talk about the real life of the entrepreneur. And I will give you, uh, talk, talk to you about the theories and then refer back to Tim to tell, so that he can tell you parts of it as he uh, went through in his life. Now, there are times that both Sridhar and I may chime in because uh, Sridhar has actually developed uh, several products. He uh, was in popular science last year because of a hubless windmill that he developed and they thought was revolutionary. Uh, I actually was a student entrepreneur as an undergraduate creating a business consulting to the city government in my hometown. And I employed all, all my professors. So when I graduated, they all stood up and applauded as I walked across the stage to get my diploma. Uh, but I sold that business a few years later, and uh, after, from then on, was a uh, lifelong academic. So, we'll start with the real life of entrepreneurs. Then we're going to spend some time focusing on finding ideas, because we know that's one of the most challenging issues facing all of us when we're trying to start businesses, trying to figure out what business to start. And that's also a place where trial and error, which means also success and failure, is a natural part of what happens. We're going to spend the last part of the evening talking about uh, uh, how to fail successfully. I know that sounds a little strange, but in fact, if you fail the right way, you are actually laying the groundwork for future success, and we'll talk to you about how that's done. 
So there are three elements in uh, the real life of contemporary entrepreneurs. First, there is passion. Passion is central to what makes an entrepreneur tick. Passion uh, is what you need to survive the tough times, the days when people, you're trying to sell your, your product or service and people keep saying no, no, no. Passion is what keeps you going when you are trying to develop a prototype and every time you do it, it fails, it breaks. So passion is a starting point. What was yours? So this is where I'm gonna start jumping in with my story, okay? It's gonna be a very boring story. So when I was an undergrad, I was very interested in sports. I would go to ball games, I would go to football games, soccer, for us, football, for you all. I would go to football, our NFL. I'd go to basketball games. I was passionate about sports, and that's what my life was revolving around. When I got my first job, it was in sports business. When I came back to St. Louis University under him, it was because I had a pain, and my pain was this. I was at a baseball game with my dad. We were sitting there, it is a once in a lifetime moment, and we got stuck in a concession stand line. In other words, we were standing in line waiting for a soda and a hot dog while the once in a lifetime play was going on at home, at, at, within the stadium. And so my thought was this, I ended up missing that play. How many other people have ever missed a play like that? And there's quite a few. Which then started me getting to thinking, what if the best seat in the stadium was not actually in the stadium? What if the best seat in the stadium was actually on your couch at home? You have instant replays on TV, you have statistics, you have infographics, you got the fridge, you got the restrooms, and you have the power of having all that information while I'm sitting on my couch. <coughs> and yet, the energy and excitement is in the stadium. My passion was being in the stadium. My pain was what was going on at home. And so my goal was, how do you bring that all back in? Perseverance is uh, staying consistent, pers uh, pers uh, persistent in what you're trying to do. Very often, a business takes a long time to get started. If you were creating a new drug, you may spend 10 to 15 years bringing it from your idea to actually getting, getting it into people and saving lives. Even doing an app uh, can take a few weeks to get done these days. So one of the things is, how good are you at sticking to your business, even when times are bad? So from a perseverance side of things, for the first year, after I graduated, I still had a job. Everybody I talked to about my idea kept on saying that is a beautiful idea. However, it won't work. However, it won't work. However, it won't work. And I heard it for a year straight. But the bigger part is I knew in my heart, I knew in my gut, that there was actually a deeper pain that a lot of people have. If only I could get the formula right. And so in that first year, I finally decided, I'm jumping out. I'm gonna jump out and I'm gonna start this business. I have absolutely no experience in coding. Life was a technology-based business. I can access instant replays on demand, statistics, all from my phone. Right now you have the capability. This is back in 2003, before there was ever an iPhone, before most smartphones have ever come out. And we had decided we want to create a mobile app that allows sports fans to access unlimited content as if you were on your couch at home from inside the stadium. And everybody told me, no, the technology wasn't there. The content wasn't there. You have to pay billions of dollars just to access the content. The teams weren't going to go for it because now it's alienating a portion of their business because their business is selling the content across the network feeds. So, so many different things kept going no, no, no. And yet we kept on going, we kept on persevering to the point where we started the business. Every business needs investment, right? It's either going to come from your own pocket or it's going to come from somebody else's pocket. And in our case, we worked for six years from 2003 to 2009 without ever finishing our first round of funding. In other words, we were looking for a million dollars to launch this thing. We never were able to accomplish getting a million dollars. In all of that time, we kept moving forward. We kept hitting milestones. We were in 30 plus stadiums by the time that all this started going. When Steve Jobs, how many people have ever heard of Steve Jobs? Okay, who is Steve Jobs? Apple, okay. When he got up on stage and said, this is the very first iPhone, we were one of the first 10 apps on that iPhone that he showcased. We still were able to get funding. It was still an uphill, a uphill battle. And that's what it's all about. You can stop at some point in time, but you gotta persevere. You gotta be passionate about it because it's gonna get rough. 
but you've got to be able to persevere is the second big one. The third is the focus you have. There are two types of focuses that uh, people tend to fall into. And one is the promotion focus. My own father was an entrepreneur, and he had a, a store that sold all kinds of goods. You could buy rings, you could buy refrigerators, you could buy clothing. And for him, the idea was a promotion focus. He said, there's always more money. He didn't worry about taking risks because if he lost money taking a risk, he would just go on the floor of the store and sell harder, sell more diamond rings, sell more refrigerators. And in doing that, make sure that the books would balance and he could pay salaries to his employees. So my father was a person who had a very strong promotion focus. His partner in the business had a prevention focus. His partner always worried about losing something. And so for him, he would be very cautious about how to spend money because he always wanted to make sure they had enough in the bank. The two people were very opposite. My father had a promotion focus and was focused on the gains that were possible, how to make more. His partner had a prevention focus and was always concerned about what they might lose and was trying to prevent loss. Your experience. So when we got going, our whole thing was this. We really wanted to pick up a stadium, any stadium, any sport, anybody who would actually be able to allow us to validate what we were doing. Hey, we've got a great concept, we've got a prototype going, but we don't really have that team to allow us to showcase what we want to do. So we went crazy. We started promoting across the board. We ended up contacting every single person in sports business that we could come across. Anybody that was involved with the sports team, NHL, hockey, NBA, basketball, NFL, football, MLB, baseball. We were contacting anybody and everybody. Turns out there were a number of teams that wanted to take a chance on us just by blowing it out, just by literally doubling down and saying, I'm not going to fail right now. I've got a great idea. I know there's an opportunity. I just need to find one person that will allow me to start this thing. The St. Louis Cardinals were one of our first teams, baseball team. The second one that came online was the Detroit Tigers. Never met them ever. And yet they took a chance on us because they loved us and our technology. So that's from a promotion. From the prevention side, I mentioned six years, right? 2003 to 2009. The question is, is what happened in 2009? The economy tanked. We did not have funding in place. Our customers were picking up part of our revenue streams so that we could support a little bit, but we were going belly up. We were going out of business, okay? So the prevention focus was this. At some point, you've got to figure out what's the worst that's going to happen. When we talk failure that we'll be getting into, what's the worst that's going to happen? In my case, I can close this down. As long as I can help all my employees find jobs, I'll be happy. As long as I can find a job, I'm okay with that too. So the worst that can happen is this. I close it down. Do I have shame? No. It was a heck of an opportunity. In the United States, in a lot of the different areas, it is considered a badge of honor. If you not necessarily close it down for legitimate reasons, don't just drive it into the ground. But it's a badge of honor because you're going to learn so much more from going through that entire experience. It should not force you to not move forward. And so mine, from the prevention side was, I can get a job. Two weeks after we closed it down, I was approached by a group that was looking to create several football teams and a football league. And they wanted me to come aboard to help them drive the entire thing. So the prevention side was, we have to close it down, we have to close it down, that's okay. Did I fail? Financially, yes. But from an education perspective, they hired me for that reason. And also, several things that are going to come down. So you've heard what a prevention focus or promotion focus is like. Take a second think about what you are naturally like. How many of you think that you are a promotion focused kind of person? You're always thinking about what I can gain. That's what, what drives you. Show of hands, how many people here think they're promotion focused? Okay, that's almost, that's about 40%. How many of you think you are prevention focused? You're the one that worries about making sure everything is right. Show of hands, also 40%. Now there's some people who didn't raise their hand. Are you, uh, how many people here feel that they go between the two, that they have a bit of both? So, a couple, all right. And that's actually one of the things that we teach entrepreneurship students is first to figure out, do you start from a position of promotion or prevention? But we actually teach you how to do both. Because a successful entrepreneur 
has to, let's put it this way, if you don't go out and sell your product, your service, it's not going to happen. So you have to be promotion focused to get the money into your business to keep it alive. And sometimes the entrepreneur is the best person to sell because it's your passion that's invested in the business, the product, the technology. There's sometimes no one better. But you also have to watch. Uh, you have to watch to make sure you have enough money for yourself, for your employees, for your taxes, for things like that. So part of this is knowing how to balance when to go for promotion, when to go for prevention. So what does this entrepreneurial life look like? Well, we'll see if we have better luck this time. to this technique and you go around you see paint all around you and you say hey this is a paint if we talk would people be paid the money is this something I want to solve it's about looking at the world and saying what are the opportunities paints are all opportunities paint for you is opportunity for somebody so uh, let's think about a product Think about earbuds. How many of you use the earbud? Okay, so you are listening to music and you are playing the music with earbud. What kind of pains do you think people have if you are an XT member? You run 10 miles. What? Okay. Okay. If somebody is talking, they can't hear that time, right? Okay. You can't hear that one. What else? Oh. They keep falling down. That's good. That's a problem with the wire. The wires get tangled. That's a problem. Why does it get uncomfortable? 
Okay, it gets uncomfortable because it's, you sweat a lot. It's kind of pushing your thing. Your ears may change size, so it may become uncomfortable. Who else have been? That's good. It's not waterproof, so the sweat can go, electronics can go back. You may have to be tested. So think about everyday product. You use it. There are at least five things. Can this lead to a business? I want to talk about your question. So here's my question for you. You have these paints. You know what the product needs to look like. What would you create? What's that? Solution. So what kind of solution? So you are an endurance runner. You're running 50, 60, 70 kilometers at a time. You have this thing because you want to listen to music. So how would you create something better that's already, then it's already out there? What's that? Wi-Fi, okay. But, but does that hurt the pain of sitting in your ear? But that's a good solution. It solves the pain. Yep. What's that? That solves the problem with the wash. Yes. Part. With, yep. Okay. What else would you do? What kind of solutions could you come up? With? Yep. Outside the ear. Okay. Good. What else would you come up with? A little bit different. Ah, over the head? Yep. Good. Okay. Now let me take you a step further. This was solved by folks in St. Louis who came up with this idea because they were all endurance runners. The sweat would pull it out. It would also hurt after 50 kilometers. So they came up with an idea called earbuds. And earbuds is this. They started with the endurance runners, and they said, you know what? A lot of cases, people need to have that connection, that wire. They need to have it in their ear, but how best do you get it in the ear? And what they came up with was, let me give you a little thing of wax. Put it in your ear, one in the left, one in the right. Pull it out, you have the exact dimensions of your ear. So it's not gonna be rubbing and bouncing. The sweat will be coming out because it is now a seal. And what they did was they started creating these little buds that go over originally your own earbuds that you would buy. And then they started thinking, you know what? Actually, we could sell the earbuds and that little cover. And it's actually been extremely successful. It is one of the fastest growing companies in the US. They have exclusive agreements with Apple, Target, which is a major retailer, Best Buy, which is a major technology retailer, all because of this idea. But then they took it a step further. And again, using painstorming, they said, hey, that's great. That's endurance runners. But how many endurance runners are there really? There's not a lot. There's a bigger market of you and me. We call them everyday Joes. I'd rather be on my couch than running. If I run more than a kilometer, I'm probably going to be wheezing and on the ground. But I, when I run, want to listen to music. And I see all these endurance runners using it. So why can't I use it? And so they created a lower end model. And that lower end model is instead of the wax to be specifically made for my ear, is now something I can buy off the shelf. Now again, being sold in all Apple, Target, Best Buy, in every airport you go into in the United States, you can buy a pair. Because then, the next pain. I'm on a plane, and it's loud, somebody mentioned. I can now keep the sound out. That is about pain storming and the evolution of a product. So. You come up with ideas. You probably come up with multiple ideas. How do you find the right idea? Alex Bruton uh, uh, has a website called The Inographer. And what he did, he's done, done us all a great service, because he's helped us focus on how to assess what are the best ideas to pursue. He says, let's think about two things. One, impact. The fact is, all of us would like to say that what we do has a big impact. Who wants to say, I'm putting in all this energy and it's only going to make a little difference? We all want to make a big difference, maybe in a small part of people's lives like earbuds. But if you can say that you can make wearing earbuds, listening to music for hours and hours and hours a day more comfortable for people, that's, that's not trivial. And they're making good money, by the way. So impact is one factor, making a difference. The other thing is feasibility. Things can be more uh, easily done or more difficult to do. The things that are easily done are more feasible because you're more likely to be able to do it. So if we took those two dimensions, 
We're using impact on the y dimension. We're using feasibility on the x dimension. The sweet spot, the ideal situation, would be in the upper right corner, and where you see the gold uh, uh, pie slice. And that is the place where you have high impact and high feasibility. Those are the ideas that would be the most, uh, uh, the best to pursue. Now, there's one other, oh, there's one other element here. Uh, trying to decide when you have multiple ideas that uh, seem to have uh, similar characteristics, how do you make the decision? Let's think about what are pigs putting a shoe a two year old. Okay. Think about it, low kid. What do you think the pain comes? Difficult to put their foot. Yeah, that's one. He or she won't try to move. Color change. Okay, they want to enjoy it. Let me say, two-year-old is getting at a stage where the person can put the shoe by themselves. What do you think the first problems that start coming? Then they start doing the shoe. Light, right or left? They put the left one on the right and right one on the right. They have trouble sizing the shoe. So some of these things. So let's think about the situation of putting the right shoe on the left and left shoe on the right. You're going for a party. Do you want this baby or a kid to come along with you? And they put the wrong shoe. They say no left, right, right, left. And they get confused, they take it out, put it back. They, you are like them, they cry and mess. Okay. So there's a pain associated with it. How did the shoe companies try to solve this, putting a big L and big R? Okay, is that a good solution? No. No, why is that? Huh? They can't breathe. Not a problem with their eyes, it's a problem with their uh, ability to know left and right. Okay. So a lady came up with a terrific solution. This is solution number one. It's actually copied from a pattern. The idea is, there's a ball, okay, image, any image, in this particular case, the ball. Okay, when you put the two shoes together, the ball will come. So the baby can get it done. So that's idea number one. Okay, there's another idea somebody came up with, shoes, okay. So these are stickers. You can take it, fix it on the shoe, inside, outside, doesn't matter where you want. And the kid, when they put, they see a lamp. Okay, you get three. So if you have three kids, you could put on the three shoes. Our same kid has three shoes, you can still put. So we have one pay, customer pay. We think it's worth solving. There's two items. Which one do you pursue? Yeah. Second. Second. Why second one? Why not first one? First one doesn't say, think it's all the pay. Hmm? It could be used with multiple things. It's much more easier, feasible, easy for customer to adopt compared to uh, this shoe, which you have to buy the shoe itself. Here, you don't need to buy the shoe. You can work with any existing. So, if you go back to the, our original curve, impact, both have exactly the same impact. Solves the problem. One of them much more feasible, easy to do. Another is more difficult to So one of them is all the way at the top corner. <coughs> Whether you should pursue or not, <coughs> depends on your passion. Okay. See, this is a problem, I can do it, I want to do it, then you go for it. So if you figured out what has high impact, high feasibility, and inspires passion for you and your team, how do you decide if this is right? This is the right idea <coughs> to pursue as a business. We can actually make it simple for you. You need to keep three things in mind. First, the 
I think most of the folks here, how many of you here are uh, in engineering and software sciences? Show of hands. Wow, okay, how many are here from business? Hi guys, I'm a business professor. So, uh, he's an engineering professor, so we're both represented. Uh, you know, one of the things that happens when we're trying to uh, do this uh, for the an engineers and scientists, that product, that technology is what drives it. That's the, ah, you know, I know this is going to solve it. But then you, you really need two more things to make this into a viable business. One, you need to have customers. You need to have something about your technology that fits the needs of customers. Just because it's a more elegant solution, just because it's better, doesn't mean customers are going to want it. So you need to have a good technology. You need to have customers who are excited by that. It's customers who have a pain big enough to pay for your technology to make a, uh, to make a business for you. The third thing is your team. Entrepreneurship these days doesn't get done by an individual. For the business people who are in here, I will tell you, as someone trained as a business person, I don't know how to do anything. I have all kinds of business degrees, and I can do financial tables, and I can do market projections, but I can't make anything. I can't make an app. I can't make a machine. My wife says I can't make dinner. Uh, I can't make anything. So for me to achieve anything is not entrepreneur. I have to find people who make things, whether it's a cook or more likely these days, someone who's a programmer. So the fact is, I need a team to be successful. For those of you who are engineers and can make everything, you're suddenly going to stop and think about things like, how am I going to sell this? Who's going to buy this? And suddenly, those business people have some useful skills. So team, technology, customer. What does it look like playing out in real life? So this will be my last story for the evening. i got plenty of stories, but I don't want to bore you all. So, Vivid Sky was our first company, right? Ran for six years. We ended up shutting it down. We got jobs for everybody. I jumped on over and helped start a couple professional soccer teams, football teams. But then all of a sudden there was an opportunity. And the opportunity was this. Fans Live. Fans Live was an idea from a friend. Somebody just like yourself sitting in an audience who struck up the conversation. Turns out that this gentleman had a great idea, which was, how many people go to concerts? Um, how many people go to sporting events? How many people? Okay. When you're at the sporting event, if there's something awesome happening, what do you do? You pull out your phone, take a picture, take video, maybe tweet it, okay? All that is going to go to your personal social network. That's going to go to your Facebook. But guess what? There are 40, 50, 100,000 people in that stadium. At that one moment in time, as something great occurs, we are going to be best friends. I would love to see your content. You may be right on the pitch, and you get that once-in-a-lifetime shot of the goalie, just save it, you know? The Saudi national team goalie, boom. All of a sudden now, you're going on the World Cup. You have the shot, because you were standing right next to the goal. Me, I'm in the upper deck. My shot is 100,000 people, I can't even see the ball. I can't even see the goalie. You have the best shot, but I will never see it. And so our goal is this, how do we allow an entire group of what we refer to as citizen journalists to upload their content to their personal social networks but still allow everybody else to view it and vote on it so that the best stuff rises to the top. Okay? And what does that do for me? Me in the upper deck, I now have the best view. I'm not going to check out everything else you have in your social network. I'm checking out that one play. More importantly, at this moment, we're in Saudi Arabia. My St. Louis Cardinals baseball team is in the World Series at this moment, okay? Playing at three in the morning. I can't see it here in Saudi Arabia, but I can. Because the citizen journalists that are in that stadium at that moment taking videos are uploading it, and I can watch it in real time. Real time to them uploading it, okay? And in some instances, more real time than what I can actually be pursuing on ESPN.com or some other .com. And that's what fans like to think. But how did we get there? It was because we had the technology. Could I go back one slide? We had the technology from, from our Vivid Sky days. We had already created this entire platform. Video, instant replay, statistics, infographics. You could order concessions and merchandise. Well, we, why don't we take that platform and move it on over to this environment? And from this environment, the gentleman that I had met is a gentleman by the name of Ron Roy. Ron Roy's claim to success was he worked for IBM. 
He was in the room when the very first email was ever sent. Two weeks later, he was at a dinner party with a global rock star business manager who ended up saying this global rock star is going on a worldwide tour and he is not talking to anybody. He is stuck in his trailer and never coming out. When he gets on stage, the music stinks, the lighting stinks, and everybody hates it. Has anybody ever heard of David Bowie? Okay. So I'm talking about is David Bowie. So David Bowie's business manager ended up saying, I will pay you anything to bring the technology you just saw over to us. And that ended up starting a company called Ultrastar. Ultrastar was the very first e-commerce platform for every major league sports team, almost the vast majority of global recording artists, and they ended up selling to another group for almost two to four billion dollars. So he's hanging out here, doing his thing, has this idea. I've got this technology. Why don't we bring them together? Why don't we bring in more people for this team? But then we have this customer thing here. Hey, that's great. We got an idea. We got a team. Also, I want to mention our team. Okay? I'm going to time out for one sec. Engineering professor. Business, entrepreneurship professor. Myself, a doer. This is how we teach all of our classes. It is a team environment. You need to know next to you what are your hobbies, what are your passions of each person around you. Because that will start to pull into a team. There's a reason why all three of us are here, right? Otherwise, it would be redundant. And it's also a reason why Sheree is talking about his strengths, Jerry's talking about his, and I'm talking from mine. Okay? So we had the technology team, and the customer was this. Who was going to use our product? Well, in this case, we had heard that the Bundesliga, is the German professional soccer league, was very interested in a new social media platform that we were already talking about. So they have not only become our first customer, they became our first investor. And then it turns out that one of the owners of one of the Bundesliga teams has a development company, a technology-based coding group, that ended up helping us develop it. What that became was this, three circles converging on a value proposition. The teams want it because they want to get the brand out. How many people have ever heard of Manchester United? Man U. It is the number one sports brand in the world. And the reason is because they get their name everywhere. The t-shirts, the merchandise, the players, the ambassadors out there, the global presence, that's what the Buddhist League wanted. Our team, we knew what we wanted, and our technology was already there. So that became our value proposition that we went to. Okay? So now we are currently running in Germany. And that's the end of that story. I guess I got plenty of others, but that's it. Perfect. So let's talk about uh, failure. What are the critical fail, uh, uh, factors in failure? Part of this is obviously, if you don't have a clear customer in mind, you don't have a clear customer need or pain that you're solving. Uh, if you don't have a strong team, if you're trying to do everything yourself and you're not good at everything, you're sub-optimizing your company. If you don't have strong partners, because sometimes your, your team may not just be your, uh, uh, your actual co-owners, or your employees, but in fact the organizations that you reach out to as customers, as developers and the like, as Tim was talking about, that uh, he actually was able to obtain a development partner who gave him a great deal on the programming because of their shared interest and shared fascination with football and soccer. The other is if you don't have a, a superior technology, if you just are a me too, very similar to what's already out there. So those three things, literally the, the reverse of the three circles we talked about, missing any of those, it's likely to lead you to a failure. Two other things that the circles don't mention is that you don't have a clear path to profitability. How are you going to make money? I know that seems simple and obvious, but think about this one. So how does Twitter make money? Information? Uh, what? Like what? Selling information. Okay, so selling information, data mining, right? What do you have? Advertisements. Advertisements, right. Uh, and what was interesting about that is given the amount of uh, advert the success of the advertising on Twitter, uh, most of the companies that actually measure the success say, Advertising on Twitter is unsuccessful. 
It isn't worth the money that they're spending. But they're afraid to leave Twitter. So they're staying. It's not, uh, so if you think about it, it's not a viable uh, business opportunity. Twitter right now is making a great deal of money. And when you talk to business analysts, the people following the Twitter stock, they keep scratching their heads. How is this happening? It doesn't make any sense. Having a clear idea of how to make money, to, is there a way for them to make money from what the, uh, the people are actually uh, sending out that comes to data mining sort of approach? But getting money from the people who are actually sending tweets they haven't figured out how to do, getting targeted advertising hasn't worked on Twitter the way it has on Google. So they keep admitting that they don't have a clear path to profitability. They're very valuable, but they don't have a great path. The other is a lack of a protectable competitive advantage. So we're talking about your buds. Your buds now has uh, basically, the, you can go into any of these uh, half a dozen chains, global chains, and buy your buds that are different colors and different sizes to fit your ear very, very close to precisely. Are they going to face competition? Well, in fact, the first competitors are already being developed and, uh, and sold in China. Uh, total violation of the patents that your buds has, but in fact, the Chinese knockoffs are being found uh, already. I think they're already in India, right? Okay, and they're basically heading this way. So you'll be able to get, instead of paying $40 US for a pair of your buds, you will be able to get the $6 cheap Chinese knockoffs in probably six months. So one of the challenges is how do you create something that adds so much value and that has protections that keep you ahead of the competition? To be honest, we know the Yearbuds people because they are their office is down the street from us. And they know that these cheap copies are coming. And they in fact have several different generations of Yearbuds that they are ready to launch once the competition, the cheap competition, comes to America. And as soon as that happens, Everyone's going to want the latest earbuds, not the cheap copy of the old earbuds. I mean, think of this. How many of your friends want to buy an iPhone 3? Three. Right. You know? I mean, think about that. It still works. It probably will work for 10 or 15 years. They make a high quality product, but nobody wants it. They want the 5. I'm not even the 5. What? 5C? 5S. 5S. Right. So you know, that's the thing with earbuds is thing. Their competitive advantage is because they have, actually they have right now three generations, the next three generations of earbuds ready to go. And all that has to happen is the competition catches up with them. And as soon as they do, earbuds goes out again and everyone's back in, left to the dust. So if you don't have a protectable competitive advantage, protectable through patents, uh, brand name, things like that, you're facing a, uh, a real challenge. I've got another challenge for you, in fact. Uh, now, I had a question. How many of you were here last night? Looks like there were a couple. I yeah, but, okay. All right. Well, you folks are going to be a little bit of ringers. Uh, you will recognize this from last night. You may have, I expect you to have an advantage, but uh, please be respectful of the other people trying to make this one work. So, here's the deal. Uh, I'm going to show you several objects. Cool, to be exact. And these are all things that you would see, all things you would recognize. But I'm going to show you pictures of them that might be a little hard to recognize. I want you to uh, take a look, and as soon as you think you know what it is, raise your hand. And Tree, I'll hand it over to you as we get going on this. All right? Are we ready? Okay. Number one.
curtain holder. On a roll of tape, this is where you tear the tape off. Ah, oh, yeah! And that happens all the time. Another one. Nice. Nice. Good. All right. Coffee cup? Glasses to be there? No. Shots. Shots. I thought you were going to say uh, those were uh, oil pipes. How to cook. All right. Sense of perspective. 
What? Thinking out of the box. You have the comb where you just have the lines, you haven't seen the other parts of it. So your brain gets set on this idea, its lines are racks and you have to get out of that much harder. Seeing the big picture, okay? Before we go one step, let's stop here, okay? The most important thing, most of us fail to recognize the object, right? Why are we having this discussion? Because important part is we have to reflect and see what did we learn from this failure? If you say, I don't want to face it, let me go and do it, then we make the same mistake again. And we haven't learned from the failure. So, Reflection is a really, really critical piece. Whenever you are done with the activity, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? If I do it again, what will I change? Okay. Remember, part of learning from failure is reflection. That's why I'm forcing you to jump. It's not easy. Okay. Seeing the big picture is one of the things we thought. So let's go to the lessons from six blind men. Remember the story? What's the story? So these blind men feel different parts of their pet and they think it is different. So none of them are able to see the big picture. When you are actually working on the project, you are up and close, very very close to the project. You don't see the big picture anymore. Okay? And we are talking about the team. I am looking at the engineer, I want this thing done. And Jerry may be thinking about, I want this part of the business plan done. Tim is worried about how do we pitch. All our focus is very small portion we are focused on. But remember as a team, we should be able to communicate, see the big picture. If we don't see the big picture, we lose track of it. Always remember, step back. The biggest failure happens when we can't see the big picture. Okay? So the part of the big picture is talking to each other, communicating. Teamwork is really, really critical. Okay, so let me uh, be the person creating the down here. Twelve ideas up there. Twelve pictures. How many people here got all twelve right in their own mind? No hands. Eleven. Ten. Nine. Eight. Oh, so you just, just, you're just, just had a scratch, right? Okay. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Five. Certainly four, right? Absolutely four. Okay, four. Okay, three. Two. One. None. Okay, thank you. Those people who raise your hand for none, thank you for your honesty. But the point is this. Let me reverse what we did and point out every one of you failed. No one got all 12. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. There are a couple reasons to think about that. Everyone missed a few. You are not alone. The fact that you might have gotten one or two doesn't make you worse than everyone else. You actually, this is a case where getting one or two right actually puts you ahead of the game. And the fact is, in business, it's not a matter always of maximizing, of optimizing. Just doing, uh, uh, getting into business, doing the work every day, getting the job done is often a lot of what success is. Uh, Woody Allen uh, stole a line from a famous American comedian named Groucho Marx, and Groucho had said that success is 80% showing up. So the fact is that when we think about success and failure, Success comes from acting, from doing. And even if it's not today, this time, the right thing to do. Doing something and learning from it becomes essential to your eventual success. Hey, Jim. Also, really quickly, the 80% of just showing up, you're already 80% there. You showed up this evening. It means you have an interest in how to figure out how to move forward. Okay? So always keep that in the back of your mind. Literally, just showing up. You will learn something from it. You will meet somebody new, us. You will meet each other, okay? Just showing up and being involved. Also, bringing other people. 
So the next time that, that something like this happens, bring a friend, bring two friends, because that's how this whole thing grows. 80% just showing up. Now, we actually had some folks uh, uh, here who were here the night before, and we did the same, this part of the exercise, the same both nights. So, for a second, those of you who were here last night, did you do a little better tonight? Yeah, yeah. There's someone else, I thought. Okay. But the point is, they, you know, everything gets better with practice. The fact that you've gone through this and you realize that you might be looking at something familiar in an unfamiliar way from a different perspective and you need to change your thinking, you need to think outside the box, think in a different way, you're going to be more able to do it. You're going to be able to do it faster and better the next time you're in a difficult situation. You're trying to figure out when my normal solutions are not working, what else can I do? And that means that you have taken a failure or two or three or four or ten and turned it in to the start of a future success. You know what? That's what learning is all about. And remember why you are here. You put yourself, you fought in high school, taking tests and doing the best. This school takes the top 2% of students, only the top 2%, which meant you had to fight all through high school against all those other people to be among the best. And then they, you came through, you did your prep here, and some of, you, some of your friends left, you survived that, and now you're here working at one of the best schools in the world, you are competing every day. And not every competition ends in success. Some person here may have gotten a C. Oh my goodness. But you know what? You actually, that's okay, because you chose to be students, and students have the right to learn. And that right to learn gives you the right to make mistakes, to make errors. That's, and you know what makes it okay? If you learn from it. You make a mistake this time, and you learn from that how not to make the mistake the next time. And if you're really bright, you remember that and you avoid whole classes of mistakes. Then that learning, that failure, was a success. It made you a better person. It made you a better engineer, a better business person. And failure is not final. Okay. Let's talk about famous failures. Thomas Edison, in creating the light bulb, went through more than 9,000 different combinations. He tried 9,000 plus different materials till he found tungsten uh, and figured out how the exact way to do that to make a sustainable uh, working light bulb. Henry Ford, famous car maker, his first car was a financial failure. Akio Morita was the founder of Sony, but his first product was a rice cooker that he was selling in post-war Japan. And first off, it was a lousy rice cooker. It burned the rice. So, uh, okay, how many of you have gone to KFC, eaten a KFC chicken? KFC chicken, right? Okay, KFC chicken was made by Colonel Harlan Sanders. He was 65 years old when he came up with the recipe. And to get his business launched, he took chicken and his business plan to a thousand people, bankers, rich people, the friends of rich people, the friends and, of friends and friends of family, trying to find someone who will give him the money to create the KFC restaurant. By the way, he had two failed restaurants before starting KFC. But it's even there, it took a thousand uh, personal contacts to make that work. By the way, that's, you think a thousand personal contacts is unreasonable? See that man over there? The short one. <laughs> he started working for me about a year and a half ago. And what he did in the first year, 365 days, he had 500 coffees with local entrepreneurs and local government officials and local corporate executives to help understand the entrepreneurial climate and the entrepreneurial ecosystem of our city. And I will tell you a secret, he hates coffee. <laughs> now, this goes, to, now, this goes back to when we talk about perseverance, persistence, he's got it in droves. But the fact is, Good entrepreneurs have to do it. Car Carmen think there's 1,000 pitches. All right, Steve Jobs, everyone said he knows him, but do you know what Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak's first business was? 
Next. Next. Business. Next was actually his next business, but it wasn't his. It wasn't his first. That was next was after Apple. So Wozniak and Jobs. Uh, when uh, Wozniak was in college, uh, Jobs talked him into making a blue box. A blue box was an ancient technology back when we had telephone lines with uh, uh, wires on them, and what you would do, it would generate a tone that would give you free long distance calls on your uh, landline. And so uh, these were by the massively illegal. And Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were making them in Wozniak's uh, dorm room, and Steve Jobs would go around the campus selling them. And the rector of the university discovered this, and you uh, wonder what the rector said? The rector called in Wozniak and Jobs, and found out Jobs wasn't even a student at the university, and said, get out of here. And then he turned to Wozniak, what are you doing? I'm making things. I'm an engineer. Stop that. Okay. It was a massive failure. Wozniak almost got thrown out of college. And if Jones hadn't been uh, already dropped a college dropout, he would have been in trouble too. So that was their first business and was a failure. But the two of them actually created a kit computer, which also was a failure. But the kit computer and their teamwork, their experience together, got them to create the Apple computer. And you all know that Apple computer was an enormous success led to the Macintosh, led to the iPhone. Mac, uh, uh, but, but you were right. Jones then had a, uh, was, he was pushed out of Apple because when he was young, he was a jerk. So the board of trust, the board of directors of Apple fired him. And he went off and started the next computer. And the next computer was an enormous financial failure. But, did you want to do the book? Sure. sure. But the Apple products you have now, the iBook, the iMac, the iPad, the iPod, all is from the technology based off of Next. He brought it all with him when he came back to Apple, and that was the evolution of Apple. Bill Gates, Microsoft, right? Uh, he and uh, Paul Allen, his partner, uh, had their first business was Trapometer. Uh, they were fired by the city of Seattle when they found out the, that uh, what Gates and uh, uh, Gates and Allen did, this was a, a program designed to keep uh, to time the traffic lights in downtown Seattle, Washington. And the guys scheduled a, a little tweak in the program where uh, late on Saturday night, all of the lights along a strip of road would turn green at the same time. So they could literally uh, go driving drag racing down the streets through downtown Seattle late at night, and they will uh, all the lights will be green when they want to go through them. When the city found out about this, they fired the boys. When the, the they were well, by the way, these guys were in high school then. Bill Gates was in high school then, and when the high school found out because this was a big uh, uh, made the newspapers in Seattle, they found out thought, oh my God, Gates and Allen did programming for us here in the high school. And they went to look, they hired a, a professional uh, programmer to look at this code. And what the code uh, uh, the programmer found was Gates and Allen had created a, a little snippet of code so that when they were in a class with girls, because this was a school with boys and girls, they had ranked the attractiveness of every girl in the high school. And what it did, the program put them in the middle and surrounded them with the prettiest girls. <laughs> They got fired again. Okay. Mark Zuckerberg, uh, the first version of uh, uh, his first major uh, business was a clone, a knockoff of Hot or Not, which also failed. Uh, uh, Steve, Steve Blank, who is a, uh, a professor of entrepreneurship at Stanford, had a company called uh, Rocket Science Games, which thought it was going to revolutionize the video gaming industry, and it lost millions of dollars. But he came back and uh, started a company called Epiphany and became, again, once again, a millionaire. All right, then. So what are the lessons of these people's stories? There is a right way to fail. First off, fail fast. The faster you fail, the faster you can move on to the right answer. Uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting, I had a German professor 
and he said that he, he had uh, told us an old German thing, which was, you will make 10,000 mistakes learning this language. Make them as quickly as possible. And that actually makes sense when you're thinking about other kinds of businesses. Uh, I don't know why the, below that should be uh, uh, spell small. Anyone here ever see Chris Rock, the comedian, sometimes a movie star? Few people? Okay, I couldn't put one of his videos up because oh, his language is terrible. So I'd, be, I'd be run out of the country. Uh, but when he has new material to uh, what he does, he goes and finds a small club, a small comedy club, where people might, oh, that's Chris Rock, but the cameras aren't there, the, you know, no one's recording, and that's where he tries out his new material. So he does, if it fails, it fails only in one small location, not on global TV. Fail often in order to succeed. Ideo is a uh, company that specializes in advising companies on new products and services. And one of the things that they say is successful companies uh, find that it takes 3,000 ideas to get one good one. So again, you need to do a lot of failure to get to the right idea. And as we were talking before, Failure isn't failure if it propels you forward. The next computer wasn't a failure if it's literally the computer, the, the, the software and technology underlying your iPhones and iPads. That's not a failure. That's a start point for it. So you can also, along those lines, uh, uh, celebrate failure. Tata is uh, Indian car company, they actually give an annual prize for the biggest failure of the year. And it's not just for Tata, they'll they invite other companies to submit their biggest failure. They also ask, what did you learn from that failure? What did your company learn? And from that, seeing that even big companies can make mistakes and come down from it, that actually helps everyone feel better about making a mistake today as long as you're doing it in a way that prepares you to do better tomorrow. Now that said, people have told us here, well, we've been here a few days now, that sometimes failure isn't an option. That's actually a, a phrase from uh, the Apollo 13 mission. But what do you do? Let me tell you why the United States was created. The United States was created to give each and every one of you a place to go and fail, and fail spectacularly, and no one in Saudi Arabia will ever know. So if you say, I can't start a business here because if I fail, I will embarrass my family, don't do it. Come to America. We welcome you. We uh, have a lot of support for entrepreneurs. Come to America. Start your business. If you become a millionaire, bring, come, bring the money back here. Your family will appreciate you. If you don't succeed, you come back and just leave the story behind. So fail somewhere else. That's one way. If uh, you can actually say, we were talking about this idea, it's not a failure if you've learned from it. So what you have done is you put yourself in a situation where you could learn something. And yeah, I failed. I, I may have failed in doing this, but I learned a lot from it. Failure focuses you. Tim figured out from his first business and the problems he had there, how to avoid those program, pro problems in his second business in Fans Live. So that in effect, failure helps you focus, it helps you learn, and it becomes in effect a test market. Test markets are okay. Test, not all test markets work. Uh, not every product in the test market goes on to sell. But knowing that, and knowing that quickly and inexpensively, that's valuable. That's not a failure. That's actually a smart, that's a smart way to figure out the right thing to do. And failure can also be a foundation for success. We keep talking about this. It helps you redirect. It helps you restart. Or, in particular, the language we use today, it helps you pivot. So let's think about the story. Fear is supposed to be the most innovative started as Minnesota Mines and Minerals. Then they have all sorts of products, so they kind of said it's free and so uh, you don't need to worry about minerals, it's all about the One of the division of free and came up with ultrasound. You know ultrasound, right? You can look into the body. You can look into lots of stuff. This one they created so that they can tell 
whether a baby is in the breech position, which is horizontal position, which results in the C section. So, they want thought, doctors can look into the tummy and figure out the baby breech and that. It helps them and it's a great tool. They completed all the product development. Seven years, tons of money. Tons of money and it's ready to mark. So they go to the hospital and say, here is it. You can look at it, tell you whether the baby is in breach or not. So the doctor looks at it and say, well, with all our experience, we can tell whether the baby is in breach or not. You really don't need this machine. All you need to do is feed the tablet with our experience. Man, remember, we developed the product for seven years, and they say with their experience, they can tell. It costs a million dollars and nobody is willing to pay. What do you think you would do? Do you consider this a failure or not? Yeah. We did not ask the customer. We developed it because we have the technology and we are pushing it. it seemed to be a failure, right? So what do you think you would do if you are stuck with this ultrasound machine that you have spent money, seven years of your life, developing? So you could say that this can tell whether it's a girl or boy. That's one thing it can. Do. What else could be? Better market. What? Better market. Better market. Better marketing for the product. Better market. You can tell this can do all these factors. So they look back and they say, all my experience, I can tell whether the baby is in breach or not. So who doesn't have experience? People who just graduate out of the medical school, starting the practice, don't have experience. So they started up going to first the market. That is, people who just graduated and say, hey, this one would help you. You don't have the experience. This would make it safe for you. Tell whether the baby is in breach or not. So they started buying. And they also found other things. You can tell whether it's boy or girl. Okay. You can tell whether there's any abnormality any medical problem. It can tell whether they're twins are triplets. Until that time, twins is surprised. You don't know whether they're twins are triplets. Okay. So that it can tell. And they also found very interesting thing. Mothers used to see this picture, which is kind of hazy, say, I see my baby there. And they started going to these end doctors because they want to see the baby. Okay? So the older doctors, even though they have the experience to tell whether the breach are done, they started by the ultrasound. That's how. So, some point of time, we all make mistakes. When you make a mistake, when it's a failure, you always think, how can I change, proceed forward, so I lead to a success? A couple other ways you can pivot. One is to change technology. So, I have a student back in St. Louis who uh, is determined to develop a personal allergen tester. Uh, and she's been looking at creating a device that looks like a uh, a glucose meter for people for diabetics and it would have test strips and that's a very technologically expensive solution one of her advisors came to her and said well, why don't you just make strips that are more like a litmus test that would test each allergen and suddenly the cost went from uh, literally millions of dollars to develop the device and the strips to a few thousand dollars to find the allergen uh, reactive strip of uh, chemicals and so changing the technology took an idea and made it from something infeasible for, tech, for cost reasons to something eminently doable and quick and cheap. There's also the thing of changing partners. For a long time, record companies were fighting uh, uh, to try and get more record sales, and they would raise the price to increase their revenue and things like that. Couldn't find anything. They had the wrong partners. Record stores were not the partner that would make them successful. Steve Jobs, to the rescue one more time, he went to record companies and said, I am going to sell rec I'm going to sell your music online, and I want you to let me sell each individual record for 99 cents. One track, 99 cents US. They fought this, they thought it was horrible, but in the end, he was persistent, and they said yes, and the record companies never made more money in their lives. They closed down their record pressing plants. They stopped needing to make CDs. Most of their sales come online at a fraction of the price that they were getting before, so their profit margins grew up. 
So it's always possible by changing partners, you change your, uh, your opportunities for success. Well, folks, we promised we would keep this down to an hour and a quarter, and it's an hour and 17 minutes. Okay, I know that's a little bit over an hour and a quarter. I apologize. I failed. But I hope you learned something from our failures tonight. Uh, we thank you for taking time to spend with us. Uh, do we need? Uh, do we have time to take a couple questions if there are any? Maybe two questions. Two questions. Make them good. Just, okay. Two questions. Thank for the this great presentation. Let me say that it's the two contributions because I, I have the two from three questions. Uh, my uh, my first question uh, is about uh, 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 see the big picture. Well, you say the, you, you need to see the big picture. Uh, well, what's the, uh, you mentioned one, one of the ways that I can see the picture, which is talk with the people, talk with other people. Yeah. Uh, are there any, sorry, could you tell me some highlights uh, or about some other methodology that I can see in the big picture? Uh, there are actually websites out there. You can go and find technologies or find, there are, are websites like Springwise where people post their concerns, their problems. It's literally a painstorming website where people say, I wish there was a product that did this. I wish there were a technology that did that. And that's a way to look for these kind of pains and these kind of changes. Environmental scanning, you all have to do a lot of reading for your class. And you start reading and you start hearing about new technologies or you're, you're taking a class in uh, the general studies and you're hearing about the changes in the demographics so that there are gonna be more old people like me what does that mean? More old people like me? We're slow. We drive slow. We get sick easy. Think of all the opportunities that offers for you. So things like that. You can find these things out almost everywhere. And he's an expert at this. So ask him after we're gone. One more thing. If you're having trouble, you think you're not making a progress, that means you don't have one way to step back is take a break. Sometimes half an hour break, 15 minute break, get your mind off. You can do that. Or explain your problem to another friend. When you explain, other person sees it better, more important, you will see it better too. So those are two simple things. So we are going to be here after. So feel free. We're going to shut it down now. But come on down and ask this question. This is only the first step for you. You can be in connect with all of us. Trey Gady, who is sitting in the front row, was actually one of our adjunct professors at St. Louis University. He's now working over at Saudi Aramco and their entrepreneurship group, working with Wild as well. You have Wild as well. Hit him up with questions. Matter of fact, pitch him ideas. Bring more people in and have them pitch their ideas. Use all of us. This is your network. Each of you are your own network. But what we're going to do is close it down if it's okay. And if you have questions, just come on down afterwards. Okay? So I want you all to thank with me, you know, the distinguished speakers for tonight. So please let us give them all. I want you loudly, you know, with the spirit of an entrepreneur to say to all the three of them, thank you. So I'm going to count one, two, and three. And after three, you say thank you, you know, with, 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 with passion, okay? Just to say to them that we really appreciate, you know, you being here with us tonight. So one, two, and three. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. So he wants it in Arabic. So let's do it in Arabic. Shukran, right? One, two, and three. Awesome.